we'll go ahead and get started um, for this afternoon session at Drive 2014. I hope everyone's having a great time. My name is Matt. I'm the room host. If you need anything, come see me or anybody else affiliated with the University of Washington that's under the age of 35 and we'll probably run and get you something. Um, uh, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Bill Yock and Sean Drew. Bill, Sean. Uh, Bill is the Executive Director uh, of Enterprise Information Services at the University of Washington and is, a, and is a leader in enterprise information management, enterprise architecture, and database administration activities. In 2006, he co-founded the university's Data Management Committee and established their first formal data governance program. He is the chairman of the board for the Kuali Rice Middleware Project, a consortium of higher education institutions developing open source administrative software. Bill is a member of the Internet 2's In Common Steering Committee and acting executive director of a new consortia effort around identity and access management called CIPHER, an acronym for Community Identity Framework for Education and Research. Uh, Sean Drew. Sean is a senior application systems engineer of the University of Washington Information Technology. He oversees the integration of advance, uh, of advance with other UW uh, administrative systems and is a data integration expert and a data hero, if you were uh, in the room this morning. <laughs> Uh, Sean previously served as the Director of Information Management for uh, University of Washington Advancement. Uh, I just found out uh, earlier that uh, this year is Sean's 20th year at the University of Washington and by some measures he's, he's still a baby so he has about 15, 20, 20 more years to go at the University. So with that, uh, let's give um, Sean and Bill a, a warm drive welcome. Well, thank you, Matt. Am I on? I'm okay. All right. So uh, when, when Sean approached me a few weeks ago about coming and talking at Drive on identity management, I was thinking, what, are you crazy? This is, this is a conference about using data and visualizing data and, and, and accessing data. Identity management is more about protecting data and, and not giving access out so readily. So uh, I'm not surprised that uh, you know, there's, there's not a larger audience here for us, um, you know, given the nature of this. But I am glad that you are all here. Uh, because I do believe that protecting data, and especially identity data, is, is one of the most important things that we should be doing. Um, just a little uh, background about myself. I, I also, at the University of Washington, uh, back in 2005, really started up their data warehouse program. So I am an analytics geek as well. Uh, so I've been doing a lot of that uh, you know, throughout my career. But more and more in the last couple of years, I've get, been getting involved in what I call the ultimate information management challenge, which is really identity and access management challenges. And so today I'd like to share with you some of the, the work that I am doing with various communities, um, including the Internet2 in common community, uh, what I'm also doing at the University of Washington, and this, a, a little bit about this new thing that I'm, I'm starting up called Cypher. So I have a couple of theories about data. One is, is that the more data that you have, the more there are people out there that want to steal it, especially identity data. And you know, the reality of the world is that identity management is becoming more and more complex and more challenging. Just out of curiosity, a uh, quick, quick poll. How many of you have been the victim of identity theft? About half of you, OK. How many of you have been a victim of identity theft more than once? Yeah, another one? Okay. I, I've been a victim four times now, I think, if I, rem I remember correctly, like three credit card problems. And one, somebody actually stole mail out of my mailbox um, before we actually had a, a lock on the mailbox. So yeah, another twice? Okay. So yeah, it's starting to, it, it's unfortunate. The reality of the world is it's, it, we're starting to become sort of jaded to the, 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 this overwhelming um, breach of data that's going on out there, right? I saw a statistic yesterday that uh, 1.5 billion emails have been compromised out there uh, in the world. That's like one in every six people. 
now a lot of us have multiple email uh, you know, credentials and accounts, I suspect, but, you know, that, that factors into that. But that, that is a staggering number if you think about it, just staggering. And you know, there's a variety of reasons why this is happening, right? I mean, there's um, uh, social, uh, cloud-based, mobile-based. You know, the the expectations that we all have about uh, you know uh, ready access to the information uh, is is really changing our world. Uh, there's many different types of identities out there, right? The whole Internet of Things, right? It's not just about people anymore, right? It's now Google finding out about my home heating system and things like that, right? You know, it's, it's amazing uh, what it is that we're tracking out there from an identity perspective. All of that obviously is, is increasing our risk too. Um, more complex the systems are, uh, the more mobile social types of interactions that we're having in that is just increasing the, the amount of risk uh, that we have out there. So, no real surprise, I'm sure, to any of you that you know, we, we are dealing with a very complex challenge. So three things I'd like you to take away from today's talk. First of all, uh, we want to give you some information about what is the identity management landscape. And this is both from a perspective of you as an individual or a, you know, an informed citizen and what can you do to help in an identity management situation as well as what your institutions are doing to help protect you. And there's a lot of heroes behind the scenes that are working very hard from a policy and, and uh, technology perspective to provide uh, protections for you out there. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. And I also like to talk a little bit about what we as a community of higher ed can do to help protect each other. And so talk a little bit about some of the activities that I'm involved with uh, of uh, Internet 2 and In Common, where that is a, you know, a member, a higher ed member institutions that have come together to work together on these, these uh, challenges and solutions. Uh, also a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that, are, that I'm seeing that are upcoming, uh, that, that we're evolving, you know, hopefully some new technologies and, and, and practices to protect us and protect our identity data. Uh, I'm going to talk mainly about uh, more of the governance uh, angles of, of this, and, uh, and I, I want to also stress that you know, protecting this information, this, our identities, is not just about technology, although there's lots of good technologies out there that we can bring to bear to, the, you know, to help solve the problem. But it's, it's really more of a, uh, a governance issue of making sure that we have appropriate standards and policies and guidelines in place, appropriate agreements between institutions and people about how we use the data, uh, you know, and it's a real balancing act. It, it's, uh, there is, the, on the one hand, the need to want to have the data freely available, you know, and, and I hear that term all the time, let's free the data as well as we obviously have to have protections. You know, we have to hold true to some principles of access of least privilege or uh, you know, things like that. So there is a real governance issue to managing our identity data. Now this is an area that I have some um, familiarity with is, is actually uh, creating governance programs to help with management of the data. I wanna talk a little bit about that. I can go to the next one here. Uh, and I'll first talk about um, some of the stuff that we're doing at the University of Washington. University of Washington is a large, complex institution, uh, as you can see from the statistics here. Uh, we have several campuses, uh, lots of schools and colleges, lots of different interdisciplinary, international uh, institutes and, and research centers. Uh, we are one of the largest uh, uh, public research institutions in, in, the, in the world. You know, we're doing about a, you know, $1.3 billion of research. A lot of that research is becoming more and more collaborative of not just researchers at the University of Washington, but with you know, researchers you know, in higher ed across the world. Um, and we have a very complex set of systems and applications and data, you know, the, our, just our administrative systems, we have a, a portfolio of over 700 different applications out there around campus. And that's not including the healthcare and learning management and things like that. 
You know, so it's a very complex uh, uh, environment. And I have been, uh, in central IT, I've been dealing uh, largely with the administrative applications. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the governance programs that we started to put around some of the administrative data uh, at the University of Washington. <clears throat> so I, I, uh, back in 2006, I met the... Um, the, the former dean of the information school, a good friend and mentor of mine, Mike Eisenberg, uh, he and I talked about the, some of the uh, dilemmas of what was going on around campus in terms of data management. Uh, and you know, we, we said, you know, governance is a big issue. Let's, let's, uh, let's form a committee and let's get, let's get going. And so our, our journey has, has sort of progressed through three major uh, periods. Uh, and I like to use some analogies back to our own uh, government, uh, the U.S. government, uh, to talk about this. So in the early days, we had sort of data anarchy, and so we had a revolution, and, and that led to uh, the formation of a constitution. Uh, and that constitution had a bill of rights that talked about, you know, uh, the principles that we hold true and dear. Like we're going to treat our data as valuable assets, and we're going to uh, try to eliminate unnecessary duplication of data and we're going to document and, and put metadata around our data and so if you look at our, our constitution you see that it, it talks about you know how to manage data you know from a high level value principle statement also in there is where we set up our branches of government so we have three branches you know we have our data trustees which are sort of the executive branch that are responsible for you know adhering to laws and regulations we have uh, what we call data custodians, that, which is really our judiciary. They're the Supreme Court. You know, when big questions come up, they have to you know, weigh in on decisions. And then the data management committee is actually the legislative branch, and it helps to actually set policies and guidelines you know, for this very complex university. So we formed that, and then you know, we, we, when, once that was up and running, and we got really sort of recognition of it, it sort of turned into this, uh, you know, these big works programs, you know, the, what we call the, the New Deal era. And it was, uh, you know, we called it the Great Data Depression. And so it was, it was really all about uh, figuring out uh, very specifically you know, access to uh, specific data sets for these different types of roles. And uh, we, we dealt with um, uh, large BI um, analytics types of projects. Uh, uh, um, the uh, Activity-based budgeting was this, this you know, big new uh, type of initiative at the university, and we have some analytics to support you know, new, new ways of doing our business and things like that. So there's a whole bunch of those New Deal types of programs that really you know, leveraged our constitution and our, our branches of government to really you know, get some work done. And now we'd like to think of ourselves as moving into the e-government um, um, period where we're starting to get our, our citizens more engaged and informed and, and active. And so, you know, this is giving them uh, tools like social tools where they can sort of vote on things and, and they can co make public comments and people can sort of come together and start to work together on some of our data management challenges, right? So it gives you a little history background um, of, of where we were, what we're doing. Curious, out of the people in the room, do, do others at other institutions have anything analogous to this? I see one gentleman in the back. Yeah. So we, we patterned some of our material and stuff after some of our colleagues. I remember Berkeley and Michigan in particular, uh, some other folks, you know. So uh, I, it's a good thing to have, you know, to have a, govern a formal governance program in place. Now, a lot of this really sprung up around our data warehouse, but it's amazing how this is, is turned into a lot of identity management and, and access control types of things as well. This gives you a sense of some of the amendments to our constitution, some of the big, big uh, pro projects that we worked on. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these. I'll just uh, mention a couple of them. But the, um, it, it's really amazing, um, this, this concept of data ownership versus um, data stewardship that we always struggle with. Uh, you know, and there's, 
the folks that are out there in the colleges and, and departments and units saying, but that's my student data. Why can't I use that student data? Why can't I have access to the students' home addresses? Um, you know, things like that. So we're hearing that all the time. We uh, really empowered our data custodians to be the stewards of the data because they were also the ones that knew a lot about the different laws and regulations that govern the data, like the FERPA protections around student data and things like that, right? So we, we have this really interesting education and awareness thing that we've done around all of these types of amendments uh, and projects uh, through the years where we're, we're introducing more stewardship than it is ownership. And so that's, that's really changed the, the, the conversation uh, that, to be less confrontational about these things. But things like home address. So our, our security policy at the University of Washington says that home addresses are confidentially protected data. And confidentially protected data means that you should have certain security, privacy protections around that data. So I'm curious, uh, do, you, do the folks know if your institutions have classification schemes around the data where it's, it's you know, confidential, restricted, public? I'm seeing if you had some nod, yeah. So that's a good thing. You know, think about the, the sensitivity of the data, right? Another one of those uh, data um, theorems that I have is, is that, you know, uh, any particular piece of data, you cannot get everybody to agree 100% on the definition of that data, especially from a privacy standpoint, right? Think about that. Um, even a home address, what, what's the rules and regulations around the privacy of that? It just so happens we also have sort of a, an amendment here that says for our advancement group, Home addresses are an appropriate, you know, legitimate business use of that confidential data, especially to match it with other addresses you might be getting from other sources so that you can, you can do outreach and do all those kinds of things, right? But, you know, it doesn't mean that everybody should have access to a student's at home address, especially other students in that, the same class as a student. You don't necessarily want that, them to have access to that home address because of, you know, unfortunate incidences like stalking and, and whatnot in the world. So uh, one other one I'll mention here real quickly is uh, about classification of our net IDs. And so this is um, getting to the actual identity management uh, and, and the actual um, uh, numbers that we use to identify ourselves. So at the university, we have this net ID, which is a unique identifier for each of our uh, employees. But we also have lots of other identifiers, social security numbers, employee ID numbers, and, and, and whatnot and plus uh, various email accounts, you know, that sort of identify people, whatever. So we have a classification of all those different identification of systems, you know, within our university that really helps us when we think about what do we, how do we authenticate those identities? And which, which, re, which ways do we authenticate those identities? Okay. How many of you have at your institutions shared accounts? Couple of you? You're at DJIP. Okay. So yeah, so you, you're aware that you can get a shared UWNet ID. Now, the reasons for that are hopefully far and few in between. We really discourage it because we want to provide uniqueness, uh, you know, in the use of that, uh, that that identity, you know. But in some cases, it's we need to have people share that account. Okay. So think about that, you know, uh, how you would classify the, the, the identities is, is largely um, a big influence in how you authenticate those. Okay. I'm going to turn it over now to Sean, who's going to talk a little bit more about authentication and, and how, some of the things that we can do to, to increase our authentication practices. Lighten up here a little bit with a, with a Simpsons cartoon. When we talk about authentication and sort of controlling access to things, we, we largely think about logins and passwords, but there's sort of multiple ways that, that we can do that. And the landscape is changing dramatically on how we can protect some of these, these data assets. As, um, as advancement professionals, we, we know that, that our business runs on, on data and information. And our, our alumni and donors trust us to sort of protect the information that we're using to manage that relationship. Their expectations, I think, are higher of us and how we're going to steward that information 
that they think is theirs and we use as our, you know, for, our, for our business practices. So I've always felt a sense of obligation to do our very best to, to, to use, use data to sort of enable our business process, but at the same time protect those outside the universities that would use this for, for completely other reasons. Um, that's my expectations of my bank and, and the organizations that I'm uh, involved with, and certainly should be our responsibility back to our, to our online donors. So we break down authentication, it sort of falls down into in, in these four categories. When, we, when, a, when a, our computer systems challenge someone to sort of determine, are, are you who you say you are? We challenge them with things about what they know. We ask them things about, um, about uh, what their password is. We have challenge questions for IDs. That might be secret images, different um, websites and services are trying to come up with sort of different clever ways to do to, to, to test us to make sure we are who we say we are. Uh, there's the tokens, uh, things that we have in our possessions, there's things that we are, and things that we do. Um, I think of this a little bit like uh, different ways that we, we can secure our home. Um, if the first one is I lock my front door, that's sort of one level of protection. The second one might be, well, I insure my home in case something bad happens. That's another layer of protection. The, the third one might be an alarm system. And then the fourth one might be a guard dog, depending on how nervous I am. You know, nosy neighbors. All these things are multiple levels of protection. When we map that to our computer systems, we, we frequently don't have as many layers. We, we over rely on passwords as the one way, the one key to get in. And that's becoming increasingly uh, difficult to, to, to be sure that you are who they say you are. So on the topic of the things that we know, um, we, there are certainly best practices around passwords, and, and passwords, we'll never get rid of passwords, but I think we, we definitely have to quit thinking of them as, 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 as absolute identity of, of who someone is. So you can, for, like, some of the best password, you know, uh, use standards are, you know, never use dictionary words, make your, your, uh, your, your passwords as, as complex and long as, as you can stand. Uh, never use the same password twice on, on multiple systems is a, is a common one. Come up with passphrases, you know, abbreviations and, and such. And then always store your passwords securely. A lot of these things we can't always remember. Cartoon, what's the secret password? I don't know. Correct, come on in. I, I think we have, if you look at some, what some of our, our Password sort of standards are the passwords that people actually use. They're they're sometimes ridiculously simple. This is uh, this is a common scenario we have where we set up a new account with someone, and if it's a you know, non-technical person, sometimes technical, that they'll write the password down on a sticky note and write to the monitor. Um, I'm going to call this guy Post-it Note Bob, and uh, and in some ways, uh, in some ways, he he really doesn't have a have a choice. Um, we, we will typically have, a, I went through my password safe and I have 125 different passwords for things. I don't reuse passwords because that's the best practice, but there's just no way to remember all of these things. Um, I was given an account the other day to not critical information, but this was the password that they gave me. And there's no way to remember this. There's, there's sort of no way to, um, it was a system I couldn't change, and so it gets sort of logged. And, and I don't think we're really improving our, our security by doing this. I was just talking with the Cassava guys in, um, in the previous session, and they said with their rainbow tables and their hacker tools now, on a notebook computer like this, they can crack any password at a, at a really surprising rate. Um, it, it's really almost not even fair. The computer systems now, and, and some of the, the, both the algorithms, the GPU processing, some of the things, the same tools that we're using, that people are using to mine um, bitcoins, are using being used to, to crack uh, passwords. So it's, it's really just not even even fair anymore. So the complexity of your password really isn't um, isn't protecting you as much as, as it used to. Passwords are frequently compromised. Um, we have incidents at the University of Washington every day where where, where uh, accounts are passed or. or are, are used in a way that was not from the intended user, and we end up having to, to, to flush these things out. Sometimes it's large batches. Chris, didn't we, a few months ago, have a, a large batch of, of net IDs that we had to go through and, and fully replace? Happens with some commonality. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a crack me if you can contest that happens at, at DEF CON every year. 
And it's a, it's a competition between small teams of hackers and they give them these huge databases of, of encrypted passwords. And the, the winner last year cracked uh, 50,000 of these passwords in two days. So about a thousand passwords an hour they're able to, to brute force crack. And uh, that, that's, a, that's an astounding number. And if you look at sort of the trends over the years, their ability to, to crack even good solid passwords with solid encryption is, is, is definitely increasing. Um, this year, uh, late last year in November, Adobe announced that, or it was announced for Adobe, that they'd lost 158 million accounts. Um, <coughs> It's just a staggering number. Um, they admitted that only 38 million of those were active, and, but they wouldn't tell us what active meant. Active that week, active that month. Uh, so this massive history library of, of passwords is sort of now out there in the domain. As those are being cracked, that's teaching us a lot about how people are, not teaching us, teaching the people that are cracking these things and stole them in the first place, what our human patterns are of, of building passwords. So I expect to see some of these cracking numbers uh, dramatically improve, or decrease in time, more powerful tools as we sort of better understand how people are, are constructing these things. There was another uh, massive breach in December, something called the Pony Malware, and, and it, was, it was particularly scaring and, and reminiscent of a, of a situation we had where it, it wasn't like Adobe where they, they stole a database of usernames and long hashes of encrypted passwords. This was actually a screen screen or a, a password keyboard logging um, process. So they actually were capturing everything that was typed on the keyboards of the machines that were in, infected. Um, this is scary uh, on, on a whole bunch of, of, of different levels. Um, but because it was actually happening on people's workstations, it affected every system that these people were logging into. And the systems they were logging into, they weren't really compromised. This wasn't a, a Google or a Facebook breach, because these were legitimate logins happening. It was just from compromised accounts happening at the desktop. So there's really no, you know, there's nobody to point the finger at of, you know, whose fault is this? Where was the breakdown? The breakdown was at the desktop itself. Um, the, um, after, after this happened, uh, and actually just, just earlier this, this week, um, the, the company that found the, the, the data uh, announced that there's a new version of this that has now scraped another 600,000 web credentials. Um, these things don't pop up on your virus scanners. There's really not a lot of protection that we have against having our, our stuff scraped. And another of course, scary component of this is that the, the, you know, there, there aren't companies that are sort of actively monitoring and finding this. These two breaches were discovered by security companies, companies who found files out there on the internet somewhere which contained all this data. So it's almost like whoever was using it sort of got done with it and stuck it out somewhere where it could be found or they just weren't protecting it particularly well. So we're not proactively sort of finding when this happens. And it would be difficult to know if this is happening to, to our machines also. Um, our, our, the University of Washington example was uh, a few years ago number of years ago. Now, we, we were working with an event and email registration company who got hacked. And their hack was very similar to what we described with the Pony um, software. It was, uh, it was a, a keyboard logger. And so an admin had downloaded a tool, uh, some development tool that he wanted to use for you know, reporting or data cleanup or something. And it had a, a Trojan payload in it. And it started, you know, it started logging all of his keystrokes and sending them out to a hacker in, in Asia. Um, with that information, that hacker was able to log on to this company's web service as with the credentials of the admin and start downloading all the data that was out there. Using the mechanisms and the, the functionality within that application, downloaded all the data, and over the course of that, discovered a feature in, uh, a feature in their software that allowed them to decrypt the passwords and the usernames so that they could synchronize that with another service to create sort of a federated authentication. Then they exposed that. So we found out about this because they, you know, that, that this company had discovered the breach, they found out what happened, and they sent us the list of our users who were affected. Um, it was only about 380, so not a, not a huge number. We were just getting started using that software. Um, it's a good way to have your company go to zero value. The company didn't last very long uh, directly after that. We were able to do some analysis on that file, and, and, and some of the things that I learned were that people typically use 
the bare minimum requirements for the password. If you require eight characters for the password, they use eight characters. If you re require a number in the, in the password, they're gonna put a one on the end of it. And if it's a special character, it's probably an exclamation point. So there's some very, you know, even with a small sampling, we can very clearly sort of see the patterns of how people build these things. And a lot of it's because we're forcing them to remember a lot of these things, right? So human memory is just not built to you know, remember these long textual strings of things. So with, with, you know, with the ability to sort of scrape these passwords and lose them, um, it, it, it becomes a, a difficult challenge for us to, to rely on, on just passwords. So um, the software keyboard loggers, um, this is a you know, software you can download, you can Google search this. I would encourage you to not download and install these things unless you're within a VM and you control, you can just delete the VM when you're done because although the keyboard loggers don't register as a virus, they'll run. They have payloads attached to them which download a lot of other stuff. People that want to become hackers or test out hacking tools get compromised very quickly. So be very careful, careful if you do that. Um, this other one, uh, the hardware keyboard loggers are a very interesting thing. You can actually go out on Amazon and buy these little devices. They're sold under sort of a, uh, protect your children from the internet so you can monitor your cheese spying your kids but it's a little USB key plug it into the back of your keyboard plug it into your computer it has Wi-Fi built in but it will record every keystroke happening on these machines and email it out to you completely undetectable from any software because it's, it's acting just like a like, like a keyboard essentially so um, the next sort of way we have to protect ourselves are things that we have. We have smart cards, uh, RFID cards, tokens, um, mobile phones. Our implementation of advance, we require a token. We have an entrust token, so we have a multi-factor implemented. Um, we did that not very long after we discovered this this other um, this compromise of this vendor that we had. We you know, we realized pretty early on that the passwords were not enough to protect this donor information that we were responsible for. Mobile phones today are sort of the hot new um, token device. Uh, my Google, my email Google account or Google accounts allow you to enable multi-factor. It'll send you a text message with a key in it. You have to type that key into the screen to be able to log on. That vastly improves your ability to sort of make sure that people are who they say they are. The newer ones, there's, there's actually a new one as, as part of a, a company called Duo, Duo, which is part of InCommon. And what they do is uh, not send you a text message, but you register the application within your phone. Your phone pops up on a message when you attempt to log on. You acknowledge that message, and it just instantly go, goes back. Um, Google just uh, acquired a new technology um, from a company called Slick Login, where it will, when you try to log on, your computer emits this high-pitched screech that you can't hear, but your phone can. And if your phone can hear your computer screaming at it, then it is going to acknowledge that your phone is close to your login and it's going to validate. We'll see if it actually works, but conceptually, they're doing a lot of work in that area. Uh, things we are, a fingerprint, retinal scan, these are certainly much less used in, in direct line, more you know, data center based, but it's another important consideration if you're really trying to protect data. Um, things that we do, we're starting to see some devices like the Surface where you do like a pattern of swipes. Um, I, I, uh, with your finger on the screen, I, I can actually see people, I can almost read their password across the room because it does these like mouse trails of what they're doing. I'm, I'm not sure that's going to ultimately be the best way to, to to replace passwords, but it's still something that, that you know, but it's, a, it's an action. Um, and then more like uh, like what credit card companies do, we're, we're, I, I think we're ultimately going to end up in a, in a place where we need to start treating our, pay, our accounts more like we treat credit cards. Whereas a credit card number is sort of secure, we treat it like a secure number, but we also give it to waiters and we sort of use it in our, in our shopping, so we don't treat it the same way we treat a password. But that's because we have lots of other protections happening at the same time. We know the credit card company is insuring us like we do in, in, our, in our home example. We know that they're looking at usage patterns, that if all of a sudden we start ringing up charges in another country, they're going to they're gonna trigger on that and shut that card down. We don't do as good a job on that in, in our computer systems. If someone starts logging in from a location where we don't know, that's a pretty heavy lift to start analyzing those logs and figuring out where things are and, and adapting to that. But I, I think that's going to be coming. Um, so, Bill, this was going to be your slide. I'm looking at, at, at individual versus, uh, our siloed versus federated authentication. 
Do you want to take this? Yeah, this is, okay, sure. Um, what Sean just mentioned actually happened to me. I'm actually going to South Africa next week, and I was online trying to use my credit card to sign up for something, and the credit card company emailed me right away saying that that charge was denied because they thought it might be fraudulent, but I could click the button and say it was okay, it was acceptable, and then I was able to actually complete that transaction, and it was like, wow, that was that was pretty impressive. So I was, th that's just a, a sense of the where we would like to get to as institutions to be able to provide that you know that level of analytics and services, and a, a part of the way that we do that is figuring out how to do identity management in a federated way where. Identities are managed in lots of different places by lots of different uh, people. So let me sort of move into uh, uh, in common and, and what some of the services are around in common. Does everybody know what Internet 2 is? Anybody that doesn't? So Internet 2 is a, they're the ones that actually, um, uh, it, it's, it's a uh, higher ed members have come together to create a high speed network for research purposes. So we run the largest private network, internet, across higher ed institutions and government institutions. Uh, so originally, you know, many years back, it was all about just the networking infrastructure to do science and research around the internet. Internet 2 has moved on into more services, uh, and including cloud services for supporting higher ed um, uh, activities on top of that, that high-speed network. And InCommon is a company that is owned by Internet2 to help with uh, trusted identities and, and uh, some of the services that they have. Um, and we'd like to uh, uh, comment that, that uh, in, in higher ed, we always think of ourselves as sort of unique snowflakes, that we're all, you know, all of our higher ed institutions are, are unique in some fashion. Uh, well, I'd like to argue that we're, we're not as uh, uncommon as you might think. So InCommon offers these basic services, and some of these are evolving, but the, the, the primary one, Federation of Identities, I'll talk about in just a second a little bit more. We also offer a level of assurance where it's sort of a certification process that we, we offer uh, certifying the people in the Federation. Uh, and then we're getting heavily involved in some of the multi-factor things. Uh, Sean was just sort of indicating some of the up and coming things like Duo is a company that offers a, a, a multi-factor send, you know, send to your phone, you enter in the PIN, do the login, you know, complete the logins, those types of things. And then certificate services are all about securing and encrypting channels between devices or computers or, or websites, right? So websites out in the world need to have a certificate so they can do the SSL encryptions and things like that. InCommon offers services to higher ed. If, you, if your institutions are not a part of InCommon, I would strongly encourage all of you to go back and talk to the folks that, that are involved in this to think about getting involved and in, in, in taking advantage of some of these services. And I, I'm going to spin through uh, several slides here real quick, Again, looking at the time, we're, we're about out of time. But uh, real quickly, what Federation is in a nutshell, um, this is the non-federated version. So if I'm a consumer or a client or I'm a staff member at a university or if I'm a student, I might be trying to log into wikis, I might be trying to look, log into re, you know, top science search, re, research applications, I might be trying to access government resources out there, uh, you name it, you know. Uh, how many accounts did you say you had? 140 or something in your password safe? Yeah. So managing 140 accounts all over the place is, is, is uh, mind boggling when you think about that. Well, what, one of the things that InCommon offers is federated identities so that you can use that one and it, all of these folks over here can trust this one. And it's really some of the things that we do that guarantees that these people that are operating these, these identity management systems are doing so in safe ways. It gives a certain trust level for the people that have services out there that they want people to use to be able to easily use that login rather than managing accounts throughout all of them. Does that make sense? 
So there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes to make that all happen. Um, I won't belabor these, these two slides where it sort of talks about, this is, I, this is the stuff I'm doing in Cypher, the, the, the community identity framework stuff where it really talks about uh, identity matching and how do we control the release of person's attributes out there to other people in the world. So if this, is, um, if this service provider is Google, and I'm trying to you know, give my institution, the UW, uh, uh, the permission to release my credentials to Google so I can do Google Apps. That's sort of, you know, sort of implied here um, is, is sort of what this diagram was, is uh, trying to represent. There's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes for the university to talk to Google in, 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 what is, in a safe way, right? And that's sort of what the power of federation is about. So if you think about federation, where you have lots of identity providers and lots of service providers out there in your federation, and they're all playing by the same uh, rules, uh, where they've come up with agreements about how we share information and, and how we authenticate users, um, what, what information can we exchange about the users once they're authenticated? All of that kind of stuff wrapped up with in common being sort of in a certification uh, body, certifying that all of these folks are doing best practices. And in common also provides the best practice guidelines and templates and things for these folks to follow and then get certified. But once you're certified, you become a part of our metadata and that metadata is shared throughout the Federation on a daily basis so that everybody in the Federation can have a certain level of assurance that everybody is, is, is who they say they are. All these people providing uh, uh, services are providing services in a, in a safe manner, so to speak. Does that make sense? So I won't uh, skip, I'm gonna skip ahead here just a little bit and talk um, about the assurance program. Uh, there's, there's a couple of different levels of assurance, uh, the, what we call bronze and silver level. And when in common certify somebody at a certain assurance level, we're looking for different things. Are you really using strong authentication, multi-factor authentication when you're doing uh, you know, the, the, the authentication for folks? Or are you doing really strong password management types of things? Right. So that's a service that we offer as we sort of certify that people are actually doing those stronger levels of authentication and password management types of things. Uh, let me also, I'm gonna skip past this one. Uh, let me also mention that <clears throat> th this is a very timely topic, right? Because uh, um, you've probably been hearing in the press that uh, President Obama is, is really um, uh, talking about cybersecurity and, and, and the safety of, of our cyber uh, infrastructure out there in the world. Uh, the government has started to fund certain programs that in common is a part of this national strategy for trusted identities in cyberspace. And we are working on uh, enabling multi-factor authentication on multiple devices in, in multiple ways uh, for all the folks in the in common federation. And we offer uh, you know, really group uh, bulk discount pricing too, which is another uh, nice feature for joining the Uncommon services. And so here's an, an up and coming one where we're calling an insert, where you can actually install a certificate on your, your personal devices. So the, the BYOD, bring your own devices types of things, is, this is a new and up and coming thing. You know, can we ever get rid of passwords completely? I don't know, but we're, you know, we're actively working on this and there's also, uh, uh, an alliance called FIDO, uh, the Fast Identities Online Alliance, which is really working on solutions to uh, you know, eliminate the need for passwords. So um, stay tuned, lots of good uh, things happening. I think we are starting to, it may seem like we're, we're losing the war on cybersecurity, but please don't give up hope. <laughs> please become part of the solutions, be, you know, uh, being conscious even of your own password management is, is a very important part of being you know, a part of the solution. So, so with that, I know I rushed through the right there at the very end, um, but I'm more than happy to take any questions that you might have. Yes? Can you talk about a, a situation where you have worked with 
uh, different areas of DW2 uh, develop roles of different types. Like, uh, just, uh, I could be a whole presentation on the kind of how you kind of start that process and start a conversation about, you know, who should have certain types of security access and get a better instance of what you want. Sure, so if you didn't hear, the question is, could I comment on how the UW, how I'd help facilitate the, the, um, the role definition and who can have access to what information uh, at the university? Um, it, we around, when I, especially from a data warehouse perspective, uh, we created a, a control system of our own where we actually um, got our data stewards to come to the table and sort of ar articulate different roles that people play and then line that up with the different domains of data in the data warehouse, right? And so we have some roles that are sort of generic and go across multiple domains of finance and HR and student and whatnot, right? And we have some roles that are only specific to one domain, like student domain, right, and things like that. And, and so we, we actually sat down and we, we talked about the, the, um, uh, the security principles at our university, um, access of least privilege, right, um, is, is one of those that we, we hold near and, and true. Um, but we also, um, uh, also need, realize that we, we need to be able to have openness and be able to you know, provide data in a broad fashion. So it was a real balancing act to sort of come up with those roles. I, I can tell you I was worried that we'd have hundreds of roles. We've actually got, we still only have 12 different roles, you know, according to sort of a, a pre, you know, cross domain type of uh, matrix that we've created uh, that, that helps us to control the data. It's not an easy process to figure that out, by the way. Uh, there, were, there was a lot of meetings and, and you, you've got the data hawks and the data doves coming to the table saying, you know, close it down, or open it up. And, and so, you know, I, in a lot of ways, I, have, I felt a lot of my role has been playing uh, a mediator, you know, and, and trying to mediate the Middle East peace is, is almost what it seems like in, in, in a lot of ways. But other questions? And I'm happy to, to uh, answer other questions. Uh, feel free to uh, contact me uh, at any time. So, but thank you for coming and, and uh, listening. <laughs>